Welcome to the Dark Ozarks. We are discussing seances and spiritualism and how it echoes in the current debates over the paranormal, including in the Ozarks. We will get back to that in a minute, but first we want to remind you that the Dark Ozarks podcast is now available on Branson Podcast Network, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Substack, or about any other podcast platform. So what about the 19th century spiritualism movement sounds familiar today? And what is a seance, really? Well, for one, seances are often not what we think of from movies and other aspects of pop culture. But there are a lot of questions that the spiritualists of the 19th century confronted that are still being discussed in today's paranormal field. And of course, that includes the paranormal field right here in the Ozarks. We will return to what may or may not be familiar about the seance and spiritualism. But first, we want to invite you to like, follow, and subscribe to Dark Ozarks on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Substack, and as well as your favorite podcast platform. We also invite you to become a Dark Ozarks subscriber on Facebook. On the Dark Ozarks Facebook page, click subscribe, have your login information ready, and join Dark Ozarks behind the scenes for only $4.99 per month. Your $4.99 per month subscription allows you to come with us on paranormal investigations, deep dive research, and topics too controversial for public view. The next 100 subscribers will be entered in a drawing for a free Dark Ozarks t-shirt and an exclusive signed first drawing copy of the book Dark Ozarks, The Spook Light. Subscribe today to be entered in the drawing. And now you can get Dark Ozarks t-shirts for sale at darkozarts.com and paranormalsciencelab.com. We encourage you to check out Always Buying Books in Joplin, Missouri, in person and online on Facebook and at the website alwaysbuyingbooks.com for all of your reading needs, including a large section on paranormal history and more. Not to mention, the building is haunted. Tell Bob and Elise that we sent you. We also want to thank Beard Engine Brewing Company in Alba, Missouri. Beard Engine Brewing is the only English style brewery in Missouri and has been twice named Missouri's best brewery by the Missouri Brewers Association. Great beer and great food in a historical building with a noir past. And yes, their building is also haunted. Tell Nate and Tiff that we sent you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really wondering at this point uh, that we just don't make it a requirement if you are a sponsor for Dark Ozarks, you do have to have a building that is haunted. I'm good with it. I am too. <laughs> There's a challenge there. <laughs> mm -hmm. We have we have thrown out the challenge. Now we will do the investigations as well. So uh, if you're if you don't know and you'd like us to look into that, we can do that for you. But I don't know. That might it constitute a conflict of interest, but we. I, I still have incredible memories of the uh, the initial uh, survey investigation that we did in Alba, and the results of that were pretty impressive. Yes, they were, and more coming on that, and we'll be back. So, absolutely, I want the grilled peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I'm hoping they still have it on the menu, but they might, they might just make it. You're just hungry, I think. I am hungry, but <laughs> then again, I'm always hungry, so that that comes with the territory in terms of seances as we were doing research for tonight's episode i kept coming back to the fact that my um for my my knowledge of seances prior to now uh was was largely formed by two points of interest in pop culture one of them being a section of Walt Disney's The Haunted Mansion, um, the attraction, not the movie. Uh, and that is the, the point where you go through the, uh, the room with, uh, with Madame Leota, uh, oh. her head inside a crystal ball, and the, 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 the rhyme that she is, is, uh, is saying, uh, really, as, as with so many of the things about The Haunted Mansion, are, are heavily informed by paranormal understanding from the 19th century or what we would think of as vintage paranormal. 
and uh, there, there's mention of uh, ringing of bells and tapping sounds, the, or the rappings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in, the, in the room itself, several objects, including a tambourine, are flying around the room. Mm -hmm. and, and I grew up um, going on this ride. And so without really thinking about it, that uh, that section heavily informed uh, my understanding. And mm -hmm. the, the other is from a Eurythmics music video from the 1980s. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that in years. <laughs> I really like that music video. Um, <laughs> and, and it's very, again, like that, that music video is very, um, uh, very multidimensional um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and very interesting. And, and although, of course, the Haunted Mansion is definitely fits in the category of 20th century pop culture, and it is all about fun, there, there, there's a surprising amount of attention to detail and respect that I think is really imbued in that, as well as the Eurythmics music video. True. I, I, I have to agree. Um... And I think that I think that's a fair starting place for most people uh, as to our you know our idea of what is spiritualism, what what were the seances that were involved, and then the sort of the effect of the debunkers for so long so that most people think oh it was all fake or it was hoaxed etc etc and it is much more complex than that it is in uh the the influence of uh early to mid 19th century american culture on french culture and vice versa mm -hmm. i think is in and of itself fascinating we don't necessarily think of a lot of cross-cultural ideas from from that time period necessarily i don't think not because we we have an opposition to it but just because that's not part of our consciousness in sure. in terms of, uh, of, of american culture being influenced by the the french second empire culture and french second empire culture being in, influenced by american culture and really comparatively speaking, very young American culture. This is uh, uh, a developing nation uh, prior to the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, you know, really, you, you, you can't really have this discussion without starting with the Fox sisters. Um, True. And I think that um, e even in paranormal circles, the idea of, of the spiritualism movement coming from the experiences of the Fox sisters is not well understood. Um, you, you usually get this uh, sense that, oh, they, they just kind of appeared and were stage mediums and then maybe they, it was a hoax, maybe it wasn't, but how things started was a lot different. And to be honest, um, would uh, be very familiar in a lot of ways to virtually any paranormal investigator in the country today. Um, I, I agree. They, they had a haunted house. They, they, they had a haunted house. They moved in a haunted house. And, uh, uh, and it wasn't, and, and it's usually you know, the, the sisters, the daughters are talked about so much, but the mother actually was very central to the early story. Um, all three of them at night, they would hear sounds. They would hear thumps or rapping um, in the bedrooms. And um, the mother actually is the one who really started trying to figure it out. Um, and it seemed to be intentional and she started asking questions out loud basically conducting an evp session but with raps 
Yes. Uh, Which is yeah. not similar to what we do on a regular basis. Exactly. And including uh, a lot of um, the, the, the early accounts um, that um, witness accounts uh, are fairly detailed and really go into uh, a lot of the, you know, the rationale, the, the thinking process. And a lot of it was trying to figure out um, what was going on, if this was someone, and a lot of detailed questions. Virtually, as you said, what happens now on investigations. Um, but it was not in the early days, later in the spiritual movement with seances, often it focused on being a conduit for guests to communicate with certain people. Um, and in the early days, that was not part of it. It was not assumed that whatever was going on or if it was a spirit was connected to the Fox family whatsoever. Right. It, it, was, it was originally understood uh, to be associated with the location. Yes. <laughs> and then, of course, when they finally got tired of all this, they moved and it moved with them. It was a bogger. It was a bogger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we solved the spiritualism question. No, we did not. It, it <laughs> is complicated. Jumping forward with the Fox sisters, my understanding is at one point, a lot later on, one of the sisters recanted yes. and, and, and began the process that it was a hoax and then later recanted that she had recanted. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. And so, and, and I think that's the part that gets um, talked about these days, but there were a lot of people who witnessed this. I mean, a lot of people would come in. And one reason they moved from that house is because people would show up at the house to watch what was going on. Yes. And so you had a lot of witnesses and a number of them who left written accounts, fairly detailed of what happened. Um, that um, were, were really convinced that it was not a hoax by the girls. Um, and then there's been some supposition that I've, I've read that perhaps the, the recanting was just a way of trying to get away from sort of you know that that uh, spotlight that they had been under for so long that she was just tired of it so always oh, a hoax just leave me alone and yeah. maybe not realizing the snowball effect that that would have <laughs> the, the, the the social pressure I, I think is something that is important to take into account what began uh, and of course, there's there's differing opinions on what was happening at the at the house at the Fox House, and of course, this is in the, um, Upper New York State, mm -hmm. the Finger Lakes region. And what is is easy to overlook today is the uh, immense social pressure that was then placed on this family as this essentially began a new movement mm -hmm. that, that seemed to be probably not for the better for the Fox family, but for the, for the, the, the movement itself was at the right place at the right time to capture the imagination and, and propel it into something that I'm sure on that first night that the family was trying to decipher what was going on in their home that they could not have anticipated. No, I don't think so. And and sort of an irony is that part of the reason that from the modern perspective, the Fought Sisters and, and seances of that time period and everything are kind of rebuked is because they are viewed as not empirically based and not a, of an objective scientific bent. Whereas the reason that people actually became fascinated with them um, and 
they proliferated at the time was they were actually it was actually seen as a method that was empirical that was more scientific that that stepped away from the metaphysical and so uh we've we've done a 180 flip on that yeah. viewing we it have. and i think it is also important to understand the mm, the technological milieu in which this was happening was that uh, rural new america was experiencing a technological and industrial revolution mm -hmm. and that was bringing a a heretofore unheard of uh experiences and phenomena mm -hmm. into everyday lives and so as is one of the uh, reference materials that we, we were reviewing today mentioned the idea in the 19th century that if messages could be sent uh, hundreds, if not thousands of miles by radio, by radio wave, then which you know previously would have been absolutely impossible. You just simply could not conceptualize trans, uh, uh, transferring information like that. Then right. it wasn't that big of a leap to say, well, if you could, for example, send a radio message across the Atlantic, why couldn't you send a radio message into the ether to the dead? Exactly, um, which gets into sort of the later iteration of serious seances and in, invisible causations and so forth uh, in Europe. Uh, but, you know, it is a, it's a logical discussion at least in, um, and now looking back, I think, you know, people say, if you want to be, if you are really honest, you have to say, how, how much further a field is that from radio or the idea of um, uh, wireless electricity that Tesla worked on in the 1890s, 1880s and 1890s. Um, these were all concepts that, um, were taken very seriously and to be honest um we would not be doing what we're doing right now without those <laughs> ideas um, no no so, we, we so is not. it so crazy so is it so crazy that they that they you know debated these issues and and uh, experimented with it and i don't think so I, I think it's in a lot of ways a lot of this information is grounded in 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 objective rationale and it is grounded in uh the the spirit of the times which was very robust in its in its concepts of burgeoning technology and rapid change and the idea that something that was impossible not long ago suddenly could become possible and along with that came a, a concept that we in, in in the modern era looking back have a hard time because we we see the spiritualism movement shrouded in nostalgia and the, a vintage perspective, but I feel like there was a lot of excitement surrounding the spiritualism movement and the idea that these these uh, previously inexplicable answers or inexplicable questions: what happens in the afterlife? Um, how, what's going on? Is there an afterlife? Is there not an afterlife? Uh, if there is, what is, what is it like? Uh, all of these things that for time back to the antiquities uh, was, was a, a question. There was a, a, a period of time in which there was a lot of hope that objective answers could be found exactly exactly and so i, I don't think it's really fair to kind of poo poo those who who searched for those answers now um which it, it's easy to do from you know from the perspective of oh we know better or we know this or that which we may not <laughs> <laughs> well uh, true it, and it's 
again, I think that we are we are um, a bit blinded by that um, nostalgia element. We are also blinded by a, a lot of heavy industrialized indoctrination of the 20th century. Yes. And that has has both formed our perception of the world, particularly since 1893. Most people don't realize that. Uh, but with the Columbia Exposition and the idea that uh, the the great thinkers and and more specifically the great um, public public relations aspects of American corporation began to decide how the the, the West was going to see the world in mm -hmm. in a quantifiable and structured and organized way, beginning. It appears with the Columbia Exposition in Chicago in 1893, and then continuing with the bringing it to the Ozarks, uh, the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis, oh. and then looking at how that push toward what we think of as 20th century modernism or industrialized modernism then heavily impacted not only culture. But it also began to perhaps subconsciously, uh, perhaps not subconsciously, heavily impact the the, the more staid voices of uh, authorized or acceptable Christianity in North mm -hmm. America, which then began to have a uh, very negative impact upon aspects of spiritualism. Yes, and in and, and in Europe as well, and in in the uh, sort of the irony is that um, a lot of that negative impact came specifically from those religious uh, sectors accepting that what spiritualism was doing was in fact valid, and that it was authentic communication with the other side. Um, and so um, um, it wasn't that they thought they were a hoax. They thought they were that they had figured it out, but it was bad. But the opinion was that's bad. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and then over time, um, the science community, which started out as champion champions of spiritualism, um started becoming uncomfortable um and 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 turned on the movement as well it did. Um, it did. which to me is is very interesting to to look at that um about face essentially that 180 because that was not uh in many cases that was not the situation at the onset. No, and I, I think if you, you you just have to look at uh, David uh, Home in England, uh, a preeminent medium for a number of years, who was also uh, a scientist and um, uh, a professor, and, and uh, sat in a lot of scientific chairs um, um and ironically he is he is one of the very um notorious or famous uh mediums that they never could um uh, say was a hoax in fact even through all the controversy many scientists continued to um support him based on their observations of his work that um they believe that you know one he was not a hoax and two it was authentic and and real um and ultimately um his interest kind of changed as with the spiritualism movement and he got into uh, being more concerned with the the idea, the the social aspects of spiritualism. 
And just to set the stage with, <clears throat> with Daniel Douglas Holm, uh, there's a quote uh, from an article uh, published with the University of Edinburgh written by Peter Lamont that, uh, that states, quote, in 1860, a journalist reported that he had attended a seance in a private drawing room in London conducted by the celebrated medium Daniel Douglas Holm. During this seance, if we are to believe the journalist, the medium had risen in the air and for several minutes had floated horizontally around the room. The journalist ruled out trickery or his own imagination as explanations for this extraordinary event. And his honesty was vouched for by the journal's editor, William Makepeace Thackeray. Yes. Uh, and, and, and there were other uh, very uh, credible um, men who uh, supported home uh, besides Thackeray. And um, even, even with these, when you think about it, pretty extraordinary claims, you know, levitation, et cetera, um, there never was any clear um, debunking or anything else. And, and, and for the most part, he retained his credibility. And, and his, his patrons, um, and and his his followers, if you although follower may not be the correct word uh, yeah. in this particular case, uh, included Napoleon the uh, Third, Tsar mm -hmm. Alexander the uh, Second, and Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Yes, um, certainly people that you wouldn't necessarily um, consider frivolous. And it it landing on this for a moment, <clears throat> we have all grown up in, in a world that has been uh, shaped by technology. Mm -hmm. the, the eras that we're talking about here, the 1830s to 1860s, was a time which for uh, Europe and North America was a time of extraordinary change that I think is difficult for us to imagine how decontextualizing or deconstructing that was for many of the individuals who were living through it at the time. Yes. That, and, then, that, and then in America, when you get to the 1860s of the Civil War, even more so. And, and I think that it is easy for us, perhaps here on the at then at that time frontier to um, to overlook some of that um, decont decontextualization or destabilization that was brought on by the onset of technology because things moved a little less rapidly mm -hmm. uh, out here than say they did in New York or London. And at the same time, we, we think of those spaces as being very cosmopolitan, but we have to understand that, that that generation who is experiencing this rapid industrialization of technology was the first generation of humanity to suddenly be so massively impacted by change. Yes, or at least the first time in a very long time. Yeah, it, and looking at that, that, Mm, just at the time, all encompassing industrialization, uh, mm -hmm. communication, transit, um, this social reconfiguration, et cetera. What to me is really fascinating is that many of the descriptions associated with home are not dissimilar to say, West African animism or um, crazy stuff in backwoods churches in the Ozarks and Appalachia uh, or uh, Scandinavian very, shamanism. Very true. I mean, there are elements there that, that uh, have very close parallels, I mean, as far as attributes, so. It, it's, to me, it's interesting because it, I, what I keep seeing in the the the, the questions 
uh, sometimes the answers and the the conflict of spiritualism is this consistent uh, push pull or yin and yang anxiety of where do humans exist within this larger industrial onslaught. True. And then almost as a microcosm um, of that issue is how, how do different parts of society fit into that? And I, th and I think a, a good example of that as, as seances progressed and it moved on from just receiving information from whatever is there, not assuming that you are channeling or being a conduit. I think that, of course, what gave, um, say, the illusionist um, fodder for uh, attacking mediums was the move towards um, this idea of invisible causation that um, invisible forces affect, and in it, it, it was part of the 19th century and so many things, uh, social research, etc. cetera. Uh, but in spiritualism, it, uh, in the seances, it came out that suddenly the medium is a conduit um, and you get things like automatic writing and things like that. Um, and it, it uh, brought out a lot of the uh, inequities and, and just and some of the issues that society at the time didn't want to face because a lot of the mediums were women, yes. uh, particularly <laughs> young women, and who in polite society should not be in this room with all these people and maybe holding hands with men um, and <laughs> things like that. <laughs> Um, which now we laugh at, but um, they weren't laughing at the time. They weren't laughing at the time, and and as we were, you know, researching, preparing this week, one thing that that struck me is that um, whatever the debates in the current paranormal field are, um, we if if we had not kind of gone through these issues in the 19th century, we would not be um, where we are, where we have, we have paranormal teams, we, we you know, people are, are basically doing this in public, et cetera, because the social constraints have already been dealt with. And that to me is fascinating. I think it is realistic to conjecture that we owe much more to the spiritualist movement than we could possibly imagine in those mm -hmm. regards, in terms of, of breaking down some of those, uh, at the time, largely ironclad social order expectations, and probably, for the better, it's very interesting to, to look, again, at some of the restrictions that were, were expected not to be crossed in proper society and mm -hmm. particularly between men and women and it is additionally interesting uh if you were to I, I suspect take a if we could if we could time travel and we were to pluck a um an upper class um individual from say london or paris or new york from the 1830s or 40s uh, and drop them in today's society, they would probably be uh, horrified by yeah. things that we simply don't even notice. I, I think that's that's very valid. I, and then you throw in the fact that um, spiritualism and particularly seances was one of the first means of um, sort of mixing the classes. Um, that often mediums were from lower income or middle class um, background, and the patrons often were high society. 
um, this was something that just simply did not happen. That this was the time when, you know, in, in a uh, aristocratic house, you had servants' stairs, so the servants weren't seen, and so you, you know, certainly not seen in the parlor, um, or conducting the entertainment for the evening. Um, and um, it's easy to laugh at these notions, but it, it, it was a sort of a painful prog process for society to go through, um, both in North America and in Europe. Um, and, you know, even to the point that um, being a spiritualist or a medium uh, uh, became a means of and grounds um, for committing women to asylums. Yes, which I think is a, a fascinating discussion. I'm excited to dig into that. Something that I, I was thinking as we were as we were just discussing was some of the, those cross ties or points of comparison uh, between what were what was going on in the 1830s to the 1860s in Paris and England to some of the things that were going on in the Ozarks. And there is a, again, a constant pro and con uh, on, on these sides. We have the, on, on the positive side and the, these uh, heavily, what we would think of as rigidly structured uh, urban societies. Mm -hmm. Obviously a lot of, uh, um, for then, uh, positive social infrastructure, uh, access to uh, amenities, etc., that were not in, for example, Missouri in the 1830s. Um, at, at the same time, what you traded for that, and I think that it was it was an understood social contract that what you got, uh, you got in many cases um, a ready supply of of employment, you had uh, individuals providing food on the corners at cost, at, you know, for a price, but the fact that, you know, obviously the, uh, uh, the urban uh, substructure of Paris was not all growing their own food in the backyard. Yeah. Uh, they were buying it, uh, et cetera. And that while there may not have been an enormous amount of social mobility, there was a lot of, um, for at that time, safety infrastructure that you were trading. At the same time, right. something that I think is fair to say is part of the 19th century's um, attraction to the uh, expansion of the United States was that you could leave the social rigidity behind, but mm -hmm. what you were trading for it was a lack of infrastructure, a lack of a safety net, and you were going to try to make it, it is in essence on your own, and in many cases, particularly here in Missouri, during that time frame, there there was no <laughs> there was no nine one one to call. Um, no. And there was uh, there was no uh, store to go to. You were coming into this space that was unsettled. That there at the time there were no there. It wasn't. Is it a difficult road? In some cases, there were no roads. And creating uh, settlement and structure at the same time. Of course, this is jumping a bit forward into the eighteen eighties, which is you know later. But you look at the um outpost of gentility in the ozarks in the 1880s which is eureka springs and even today say for example go to the the crescent hotel which was built in 1886 um what it, you know on the on one side of the hotel is what originally was the servants quarters where yeah. they would stay um mm -hmm. after having been brought by their aristocratic employers very true, very true. And you and you you saw that in a lot of places in the Ozarks and not just um, huge resort hotels like like the Crescent. Um, uh, a lot of places were, were that way. That's 
how th how things functioned um, once you had more of a landed class. Um, and yeah, there were a lot of growing pains. And I think, you know, when, from the uh, soci um, social standpoint, um, I think it's interesting. I, th I think it's very illustrative of that, that the spiritualism movement in the beginning was very interested in physical phenomena, um, you know, tapping of the, on the table and 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 things like that, um, things moving, what we would consider poltergeist activity, um, which ironically is the focus of a lot of focus of paranormal investigations um, is looking into that physical uh, phenomena. And, but fairly early in the movement, many kind of either got bored of that or moved on and it became, it was no longer about that. It was about the unseen, you know, what causes things, um, which ironically, you know, we, we talk about in, in the paranormal field now, you know, the idea that, okay, we, for the most part, people accept that strange phenomena can occur, um, the physical phenomena. You may not agree that it's paranormal or supernatural. Um, it's, the, it's the causation that, that we kind of say we don't really know, or uh, skeptics will say there has to be another causation. Well, that's what the, the, the later spiritualist movement tried to uh, explore. Um, some of it through seances, some of it through research and, you know, uh, et cetera. But um, it's really the same discussions. It, it, it is. And fascinatingly to me, it's discussions revolving around phenomena that from a from a documentation standpoint haven't really changed in forever uh but we we see similar discussions not spiritualist discussions but similar notations about phenomena from the elizabethan era um from in some cases uh from antiquity with uh with record of uh, you know greco-roman records it is strongly suggestive that these types of phenomena have been going on forever. And mm -hmm. we're, we're still dealing with the questions of what it is. Uh, this is, and this is, this is, for me, this is, well, this is a normal conceptual leap for me. Um, it's not normal, but something <laughs> that is really fascinating is, <laughs> to me is, so much of the uh, the questions revolving spiritualism do revolve around uh, what is classified or what is thought of as the Second French Empire, uh, mm -hmm. which is the 18 year uh, rule of Napoleon the Third. It's mm -hmm. uh, 1852 to 1870, and there, there's a couple of interesting things. One is that Napoleon the Third was a patron of home. Mm -hmm. And I, I find that connection really, really fascinating. Two, um, many of the great um, aspects of 19th century American architecture are inspired or actually classified as Second Empire, uh, mm -hmm. stuff that I really, really love. And uh, just been studying it from, uh, in, in the Second Empire architecture, heavily influenced uh, Missouri architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we see it in a number of locations. Uh, the one a, a notable example of this is in a, a, what is essentially a Ozarks borderlands gateway city, very historic as well, which is St. Charles. Yes. And lots of, uh, of architecture in downtown St. Charles is Second Empire. Um, 
the uh, the Odd Fellows Hall is one of the most yeah. notable, not the only one, but certainly one of the most notable. And and again, because I'm me, I can't help but draw the comparisons uh, to Disney, and uh, because of course I can. But <laughs> that that architecture uh, did impact uh, Walt Disney immensely, mm -hmm. and. The uh, replicas of Second Empire architecture figured predominantly in what is called Main Street USA. Very true, very true. And of course, Disney is another Missouri connection. <laughs> With Marceline. Uh, and <clears throat> that, uh, that said, the, the aspect of spiritualism in seances and essentially the the uh, the the tapping or the rapping at the table uh, heavily influenced um, French culture and was a very unsettling force that I think functions as a way of seeing how the West in general began to respond both positively and negatively to the spiritualism movement and certainly the the again as you mentioned the the what was seen as a uh, perhaps unseemly destabilization of classes, uh, and, uh, and and that being heavily influenced by the um, the the role of women mm -hmm. in in this social structure, really took place in in France, in and as well as the the impact or the response of uh, the Catholic Church. Yes. Um... And, and of course, that you know came down to sort of a idea of a crisis of faith, and um, with society looking to science for answers, and um, the spiritualist movement seeming to bring that idea to Main Street um, instead of just the storied halls of universities, etc. That. Uh, to be honest, that you know the the church was very wary um, of this, um, and so you, you ended up with a number of groups kind of you know kind of distrusting each other and attacking each other in various ways that uh, really just you know, really as you said destabilized society in, in certain ways but reformed it uh, in other ways and. It's very interesting. I mean, another figure that um, of, of the time and uh, that people would be familiar with would, would be Victor Hugo. Yes. Who I, um, I, I found that very fascinating that um, as the craze started, you know, he's being isolated uh, on an island and uh, oh, I forget who it was that was there with he and his wife. And experimented with the table and believed that they communicated with the, their dead child. Yes. And I, I found that uh, that report as a whole um, to just be extraordinary. And it's, uh, of course, much of this is from, a, from an article written by John, John Monroe, uh, making the seance serious. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to be able to hopefully um, pronounce this right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's essentially the the table tapping. Yes. Uh, process the table tournant, and yeah. it is to me this this particular um, experience that Victor Hugo had and was documented uh, in terms of his, his finding consolation uh, with what he believed was his, his, his dead family member. Yes. Was extremely, uh, extremely beautiful. And from, from what we can tell, what, had to have been a very personal and a very cathartic experience. Yes, and in and, and that's a really good point. I'm glad you made that. But I think that's one aspect that we tend to overlook 
today looking back at these events is that um, they served a very a, a very valuable um, process for catharsis uh, for people where today people may go, you know, it would go to counseling or to a therapist for the same purpose. Um, and I, and I, th I, I don't think we should look down, look askance at, at this because it really served the same purpose and the same process for processing emotions. I, I agree very much with that. And something that was really striking to me, while, and, and, and perhaps even a bit heartbreaking in this, it, this is an incredibly complex subject. Mm -hmm. It and is. That <clears throat> the, the experience of the, the tablet that Victor Hugo ex, you know, went through in regards to his the passing of his family member, his his sister, uh, who had drowned uh, in a boat. His sister attack. instead of a child. That's right. I'm sorry. No, I'm good. And uh, that it was something that, and and I've had experiences similar to this, that not specifically speaking with the dead, but experiences that that could perhaps be described as as metaphysical or deeply cathartic yes. um, that that were terribly personal um terribly unique <clears throat> and were, were experiences that while they would meant a great deal and were terribly portentous to me is something that if it was suddenly splattered all over the news media uh, could become a point of mockery or could become a point of, of uh, the mundane, something that is very difficult. We're, we're dealing with something that from a, from a we're, we're potentially dealing with, and I believe we are dealing with, a, a unique intersection between uh, the mundane and the mortal with mm -hmm. the, um, the heightened or other into the metaphysical. And those don't necessarily translate well on a newspaper page. No, it, it, it's the old age, you have to be there to see it kind of thing. Um, and, and let's face it, you still see that today with discussion of the paranormal or say UFOs or other phenomena. Uh, Bigfoot's been a recent topic on the, on the uh, Dark Ozarks uh, page. Um, and, and you see this dichotomy, this very real experience that people have that had um, meaning to them and others basically mocking it. Um, you know, that if it doesn't happen to me, it doesn't happen basically. And, um, it is the same process that the 19th century tried to sort out what is evidence of an invisible force? What is evidence of the afterlife? Um, what is certainty of what we're experiencing? Um, and it happened through the spiritualism movement to a large part for that century. Um, and so that alone, I think, is something to say. It's something that should be seriously considered and not mocked. No, no, it shouldn't. At the same time, uh, something that because of the, the, the aspect that you, you really have to be there uh, in person mm -hmm. for the experience, it does open the door for for individuals to fake things for profit. Yes, yes, um, and and that is something too. Is that you know that is one thing. Over time, particularly um, in in the um, 
in the uh, social reform aspect of spiritualism, even even in even though they were as focused on seances, uh, but they would try to come up with criteria of what what is a serious uh, seance and and what are you know sort of restraints on hoaxes and so forth. And you know, one was that you wouldn't charge for it. Um, and um, although often um, it, it was a double-edged sword because it, it was it was a way of still trying to eliminate lower class women from the field because they often did it for money because they needed the income for sustenance. Uh, whereas, if you had um, um, a man or woman from higher class, they didn't have to charge, they didn't need the money. Um, and we still have, you have that debate going on today in the paranormal field. And I think it is informed from that prior debate, even though most people probably don't link them. Um, and, uh, the idea that is if you don't charge, there's no incentive to, for fakery. Well, that's not necessarily true either, because a lot of, you know, if people, if they're going to fake it, often it is for notoriety anyway, um, or attention or whatever. Um, whether or not money is the biggest evil in the world, it's not the only one. Absolutely. And it's, <clears throat> really uh just a, a i guess that weird. that being said you know um i i i've never charged for for investigations <laughs> that I, well, there may be admission fees for public events but that's something separate but um yeah. but again part of that is informed from that process of that debate of um don't invite controversy right <clears throat> right and 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 then the the other aspect of uh, a great deal of this is we're, we're also seeing the spiritualist movement develop uh, at, a, at a time when there was a lot of bombastic con artists not mm -hmm. just in the spiritualism movement uh, but just in terms of, of entertainment that was happening. Entertainment, um, uh, uh, quackery, medicine, all kinds of things. It was. And, and I, I need to correct um, myself. Um, it was um, Hugo's daughter. Um, it was his daughter. Okay. It was Leopoldine. Um, but Hugo, what, what was throwing me off in, in terms of the notes... Uh, was that the the seance essentially the the table tourna, the the table affair was uh, a family situation uh, and so Leopoldine's surviving brother was was also involved in asking questions in the process. Right, I, I recall that. Now, it's sort of an interesting point um, that I thought of right then with the tables um, at that time. Uh, it was a matter of, of raps coming through, you know, knocks, basically. Um, now, over time, as it became more of a theatrical event for at least some mediums, um, the wrapping tables turned into tipping table tables <laughs> and, uh, you know, where basically the table would move uh, or tip back and forth. And that lent itself to fakery and devices to cause it to, to tip and move. And ironically, um, table tipping is still something that is done today by psychics. Mm -hmm. it's, I think that the more you dig into the spiritualist movement, the more you begin to realize that there is an it never in, really went away. <laughs> it never really went away. And an inordinate amount of public consciousness has been informed by these aspects, perhaps because our questions um, 
throughout antiquity into the modern era or not satisfactorily answered what actually happens um, right. in in the in the afterlife and the and the debates that take place the um, manner in which uh, organized uh, or structured uh, Christian religion also informs uh, but also confronts uh, the question something that, that seemed to take place during the second empire era in France when the, the when Catholicism was definitely entrenched within the uh, authoritarian and aristocratic structures was that these questions uh, of the afterlife, these questions of, of, uh, of, you know, what happens to my family member, these are questions that should be directed toward the church, not toward a middle or lower class woman. Yeah. Um, and, and claiming to be uh, a seer or a medium. You know, uh territorial disputes basically between religion and science and metaphysics and and literally a metaphysical territory yes yeah figuratively <laughs> and literally if you want to yes. look at it that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, well we will just begin referring to this as the metaphysical wars uh, <laughs> and, that might be a good title coming out <laughs> <laughs> and you know that, that these are <clears throat> obviously these social questions and social issues were questions and issues that were being debated here in the Ozarks as well as most everywhere else where there was a newspaper. At True, and in in if, towards the end of the spiritualism movement, um, one of the most prominent spiritualist mediums was patient what was the petitional patient patient's worth yes yes and and very much at the at the end of this but you know a, a woman who really fits so many of the the those hallmarks mm -hmm. in, in terms of uh a, a essentially a a savant like response uh in terms of the mediumship uh an individual who was knowing things that you could be you could legitimately argue that she shouldn't know or shouldn't have access to yes and, and again she was from missouri so there's <laughs> connection um but i find you know I, I really do find it interesting that it, i was thinking about this earlier today there's a lot of parallels with her and um home that's a good that, point that there really was never a satisfa satisfactory explanation other than, yeah, it happened and, and she got this information that we can't explain. Um, that um, that um, did not come off as the, as the butt of the uh, debunkers, you know, and so, um, it's almost that they book in the movement, you know, he started it and she ended it and both in, in a, in a real sense, um, no one could explain them away. No. And that's, that is also interesting. And something that seems to be notable about the debunkers and one of the, 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 mm, later and certainly the most well-known debunkers was Harry Houdini. Yes. Uh, who, who wanted to be remembered not as a magician and as an escape artist, but as the man who apparently single-handedly debunked all of the spiritualism movement, is that the, um, the, the personal momentum that was created by many of these debunkers, Harry Houdini being a prime example, was at an almost religious, if not flat out religious zealot perspective 
Um, I think particularly with him, it was. I mean, it it, mm -hmm. it it did rise to that level. And it's interesting to try to do an analysis on that in the sense that the, the argument being that um, spiritualism should be debunked because it isn't objective, but some of these individuals, and let's face it, they were predominantly men, were not exhibiting a high degree of objectivity in their attempt to stamp this movement out. True. V very, very true. It, it is also, there is a little bit of an irony, irony too, because of course, uh, Harry Houdini is not his birth name. And he took his stage name actually after an illusionist of the 1800s, the great Houdin, who, by the way, was a spiritualist. It is interesting. I, <laughs> I, I would like to know uh, what personal trauma some of these individuals experienced that led them on this uh, zealous, um, essentially, witch hunt. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, there is, there is quite a bit of um, circumstantial evidence that the the science the 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 hard science circles sort of enlisted the illusionists as cohorts ironically previously they would they um disparaged illusionists um but then found them useful in um the, uh, casting aspersions on the spiritualist movement so you, you had you you continue to have all these moving uh, alliances that you know we 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 didn't get along but now we can use you to debunk the spiritualists so uh, we enlist your help and and this happened on various fronts in, in a pretty fascinating way um and yes you know what was there good from it there there was because there were there were those that were uh, frauds and Absolutely. and they were exposed um but then of course what happened is for ones that they could not expose it became a smear campaign it did and now just as a as a, as a very quick just insertion uh, i don't think that we can you know touch on the sort of this transcendent movement without briefly talking about edgar casey that's very fair i mean that's that's very fair um although you know technic technically is not necessarily part of the spiritual that this same movement but certainly no. it comes out of that tradition um and again um what 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 is analogous is that his methods are much more like the later mediums who quote were uh, conduits and um, now where those mediums tended to be conduits for whoever their guests wanted to um, hear from whether it was a family member or ironically in America, it became very common for famous founding fathers to show up at seances, George Washington, uh, John Quincy Adams, and so on and so forth, um, which, which is a little odd, but I think there is a... your favorite celebrity. <laughs> and that still happens in the paranormal field. That's for, <laughs> yeah, <he does. laughs> for the... Those that are familiar, there are those that claim to contact any celebrity that's died in the last 24 hours. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is that. And it, it is really, again, we're dealing with, we're dealing with, uh, with human emotion, we're dealing with physical, we're dealing with uh, the the concern of fame and profit it is such a constantly moving target and a quick 
um, I do have to do a, a momentary shout out. Um, the book, An American Prophet by Sidney D. Kirkpatrick uh, is a, a biography of Edgar Casey. I recently purchased the book from Always Buying Books in Joplin, Missouri. There you go. And largely on a whim, uh, just because it looked interesting. It was on the table at one of our events, thanks to, uh, to Bob bringing a number of titles. And I'm about a third of the way through the book. It is excellent. And it makes note that, first of all, a number of people attempted to debunk Edgar Cayce mm -hmm. uh, unsuccessfully. And there is a note that there was discussion between uh, Casey and Houdini. Mm -hmm. And Houdini simply does not ever mention him on, on his side in terms of, of public um, debunking. Well, and, and Casey, you know, it, his, his I guess you I guess you would say method uh, not necessarily a method that was orchestrated by him or, or you know intended is slightly different than a lot of these other mediums um it, he would just lay down yeah he he was known as a sleeping prophet he would, often would just lay down and, and go into almost a trance and just start talking um and um, so I, I think there, there, there was enough difference that made it harder for Houdini to try to uh, just say he was being fraudulent. I agree. And, you know, I, I, like, to, I like to imagine that, that Houdini uh witnessed several of of, uh, of edgar casey's trance readings and realized this was not something that he or his campaign were willing to touch and uh quietly backed off and went on their way at at the same time as you noted with the the the, the con aspect of this mm -hmm. <clears throat> is that once you get into the questions of contacting the dead uh, mm -hmm. of connecting with those in the afterlife uh, in whatever process that is you are dealing with individuals who are grieving um, mm -hmm. you're dealing with individuals who are in a in, undergoing in many cases uh, a great deal of personal and emotional trauma mm -hmm. and it does make them uh, very uh, susceptible in many cases to fraud and mm -hmm. that it, it's very understandable that individuals in those cases would be very upset with this uh, commercialization of the movement. Oh, and, and, and I agree. And I think another thing that um, intentional or not that I think kind of muddied the waters was this uh, tendency as many in the movement became more concerned with sort of very as not not just are we speaking with the dead uh in phenomena but very very esoteric uh aspects of how things in the universe work etc i think that lent itself to um at least in america what mentioned earlier this idea of we don't have a, you know, a family member coming through. We have George Washington or, or, you know, someone like that coming through. Um, and they would often make statements about current events and, um, and often come through very differently from the perceived notion of these figures. And I think, I think that was catharsis for the, all of the tensions that were going on leading up to and through the Civil War. Uh, but by the same token, um, 
whereas they were coming out as far as as a sense of patriotism and unity um, or familiarity um, that it was serving that purpose, but it gave fuel to the idea that, you know, that this is all bunk. Yeah. Yeah. And, and <laughs> sitting down to a meeting that Thomas Paine and uh, Shakespeare both send their regards. Exactly. That's a little, uh, you know, ranging from unsettling to the, the questions of uh, just how much, uh, how much, how much did the American public want to be duped? I found that was a very interesting aspect of, uh, uh, you know, toward the end of, uh, of Houdini's campaigns, which became political in terms mm -hmm. of uh, attempted legislation to outlaw fortune telling, essentially outlaw spiritualism. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Houdini finding himself deeply frustrated with this idea that uh, Americans valued their, uh, their freedom to be lied to. Yes, yes. Um, willful ignorance. Mm -hmm. Which uh, is not terribly difficult from, different from today, but also not terribly <laughs> different from uh, the, the, the questions of humanity from 200 or 400 or 800 years ago. And, and, I, and I will throw in there another connection with the, with the Ozarks when you, you mentioned the, the effort of trying to legislate uh, the movement out of existence. Um, actually in Arkansas, there was, um, success in that there were there were a number of um locations in arkansas particularly not so much in missouri but in arkansas that outlawed fortune telling um and and then um as you said because people people really wanted it when they figured out that really wasn't going to work what they then would do is say okay but you got to pay, you got to pay a fee and they would be extraordinarily high. Sometimes even in say the 1920s, they'd be like, you know, twelve, fifteen hundred dollars a year, which was, you know, but they kept, you know, th there were those that stayed in business. And so um, I, I'm not sure why Missouri didn't go through that, but but uh, I, I found a number of situations in Arkansas that did. So they, they, uh, they kind of listened to Houdini, I think. And, um, but, you know, again, as things happen that went wayside, just go to Eureka Springs and you'll see. I know, I know. And <clears throat> the, the passage of time does have an interesting impact. A question that has been running in the back of my mind as, we, as we've been talking so much of this has arisen out of what we would think of as a very very traditionalist or uh ideas that have been grappled with since antiquity suddenly mm -hmm. butting up heads with modernity and industrialization yes and one of the things that i'm i'm contemplating in terms of predominantly england and uh, in the northeastern United States at the same time, uh, mm -hmm. during the, particularly the Victorian era as well as shortly before, this uh, Victorian, now we think of as spooky, a little Halloween-esque, um, gothic morbidity obsession with death and death ritual, which was um, a big part of fashion mm -hmm. even with mm -hmm. the Victorian era. But the, the idea that modernism had stripped away the traditional, um, uh, I wanna say trappings, but more than just trappings, the, the traditional processes in which individuals coped as, as communities with mm -hmm. death 
And as you strip that away, you suddenly have these terribly modern, almost secular uh, people, uh, you know, in, in large numbers saying, how do I deal with my grief? Right. Uh, and in the interestingly, <clears throat> something that we we overlook is that this this huge rise in funereal custom with Victorian with the Victorian era of particularly England and the northeastern United States uh, was big business. It was. I mean, uh, everything from all of the decor, the morning dresses, everything. I mean, it 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 was it was. Um, it basically was the greeting card business of the 18, late 1800s. I hate to say that, but it's, you know, uh, kind of true. It was, it's, it, it was an industry um, specifically geared toward grief or the processing or the, 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 the establishment and the, um, the communication of grief as mm -hmm. a, as a culture. And of course, us in our, in our era now, look at this time um, as a through a nostalgic lens rather than through a say a um, societal structure lens or from a corporate or uh, or capitalistic lens. But right. it is it is this structure that I. I, I would potentially conjecture, and I am coming back to spiritualism in a moment, um, would conjecture was a an attempted replacement or a commercial replacement for um, what had been uh, time-honored ways to manage loss. I, I do think that is that is true, and of course, in America, then of course, the Civil War was, you know, sort of the zeitgeist of that. Um, and it, another aspect of that is because it became very, you know, rigid. You know, this this whole industry of of grieving, uh, down to you, you know, a widow would wear full mourning dress for so long and then it, it scaled down and it was again a way of making society rigid people in their place you stay it you stay in your lane do what you're supposed to do um which again does not lend lend itself to catharsis um no and i think understandably these people who are are kind of forced to to deal with this in this new structure that, you know, is separate from received tradition, they sought that release and it came from the spiritualists, but at the same time, it threatened the existing social structure and also threatened this new corporate almost corporate in the sense of uh, commercialized structure for for this process. And so um, once again, the spiritualists are standing in the crosshairs between these groups that you are a threat to us. Yes, and, and I would very much agree with that. And I also, just in terms of mm, a an interesting counter to the zeitgeist, something that seems to be consistent while the many of the practitioners of the spiritualist movement were from lower or middle class, that many of the individuals who were the, uh, uh, the recipients, those interested oftentimes, mm -hmm. beginning with Napoleon III, were, were definitely from the aristocratic class, uh, or certainly individuals of uh, a great deal of means, comparatively mm -hmm. speaking, we're, we're not dealing with the poor people uh, who, were, who were grappling with these questions. And you compare that to, for example, uh, your rural Scotch-Irish uh, here in the hills, 
who brought with them thousand miles, uh, their own contextualization of death, their their own granny women, their mm-hmm. own essentially spiritualist mediums in the mm-hmm. form of uh, of granny women, predominantly but not limited to uh, the tradition of. Uh, of those with both men and women with second sight, the mm-hmm. ability to be into the other world uh, on a on a regular basis, and it, it brings up an interesting question to me that in in many cases the the individuals who have uh, the in 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 this nineteenth century milieu the individuals who had the, the most authority, um, the most wealth, uh, the most education mm-hmm. were the ones who were desperately scrabbling at each other, uh, both for and against in this fight when many of the people who quite honestly were our forebearers and those like them mm-hmm. uh, were busy making a living, understanding a cosmology that largely contextualized the world and the other world simultaneously without all of these neurotic uh, arguments uh, amongst themselves, which I find really fascinating. I agree with you. And and another example of that, um, as you were saying that came to mind is, um, in, in particular, Mary Laveau. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> so yes. That same situation, really. And um, and her her uh, clients typically were the, the rich and powerful. Um, mm-hmm. And so and she served the same role as, you know, uh, the Scotch and the Irish um, granny women in a very real way. And it's. But then at the same time, both of the, you know, her, you know, her, she and, and other uh, voodoo uh, priests and priestesses, as well as, um, you know, Celtic um, practitioners, um, were really serving a very similar per, uh, function as spiritualist mediums. Um, and it's isn't it I- ironic now how Mary Laveau is elevated now? <laughs> yes. And the spiritualist mediums are assumed to all have been frauds. And um, in a very real sense, there was not a whole lot of difference. Not really. And I do find that fascinating. And I like the comparison. I really do. And there is something you said, you know, that so much of the the questions about this were really unsettling to societal structure because it involved uh, the threat of people getting out of their lane. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the worst case scenario in this was if you got out of your lane too much, you might get committed to an asylum. Yes, and of course that that does bring up um, the the story of of Mrs. Weldon in in London, who basically turned it on its head. I think she's my new hero. <laughs> I, I do too. <laughs> Eat your heart out, Oscar Wilde. Uh, <laughs> um, that 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 I think. You know, those those men rude the day they decided that they were going to go after her. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it it is interesting. So this is uh, the the account in particular uh, written by Judith R. Walkowitz. Um, Science in the Seance: Transgression of Gender and Genre in Late Victorian London. I'll let you uh, elucidate the, uh, the the particulars of this case. Well, um, Miss, Mrs. Weldon was unconventional for the time, which 
ultimately was her 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 crime, <laughs> according to her post. Um, and um, she was not content to play the role of a dutiful, you know, wife in the sense that she was expected to, particularly when her husband wasn't exactly <laughs> the uh, the best husband either. Um, and so she tended to um, be a little eccentric. Um, I, I think you know the fact one she gave up she gave up a, a singing career um, and was extremely bored. She ended up t um, basically running an, um, a children's home with some unconventional ideas of parenting for the time, uh, but seems to have been fairly successful at it. And then because she expressed um, affinity for spiritualism, it was convenient for her husband, who by this time wanted to be rid of her, um, to use it as a means of getting her out of the way. So basically at the time, um, you could have someone committed with the you know basically recommendation of two doctors and there wasn't a lot of strict rules on how they went about getting going about ascertaining their opinions and so he ended up working with and the fellow's name escapes me i don't have that note in front of me um who ran an asylum who basically was a, a bit of a, a comment um, for those in the in the Ozarks paranormal field. Um, he and Norman Baker probably are not that far apart. Um, probably, probably not. <laughs> so um, basically, they 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 ambush the woman at home. He brings doctors and they speak with her for a few minutes, and then, and then they you know basically. They, they write opinions that, you know, she should be committed. And uh, of course, he's doing it for money because the husband's going to pay for her stay. And um, but she she figures out what's going on, is able to basically elude them um, and basically plead ends up in court pleading her case and. Um, the officials deciding that, you know, she was not crazy. And then um, that woman Scorn decided she was going to get even and basically sued them all repeatedly. <laughs> <laughs> and successfully. And successfully representing herself. <laughs> well, I, I do want it to be noted. Um, that uh, Georgino Trehearn Weldon was Celtic in ancestry. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and in this particular case, she was um, Celtic Welsh. And her dabbling with occult spiritualism was the catalyst or excuse for her attempted uh, asylum committing. Yes. Um, and ironically, in the end, she ended up becoming a celebrity, um, doing various stage shows, writing books, etc. Um, and uh, sort of really delighting in tormenting her tormentors. Um, so, <laughs> you know, hats off to her. It is. And... <clears throat> It, it speaks to several things. One, the uh, mm, potential savviness and ebullience of uh, those of Celtic descent, which I'm never not fond of considering. It, it also puts an interesting spin on the, the controversy and the question of spiritualism, because we, we see a situation where essentially with the uh, the aristocratic and medical class, 
of the time, the dalliance with spiritualism under the right circumstances, i.e. getting your troublesome spouse out of the way, mm-hmm. was, uh, was, was a good enough excuse uh, to, to do that. A- at the same time, uh, Weldon's, uh, Georgina Treherne Weldon's uh, success also really speaks, and, and the fact that it, it could be fair to say that she became an urban folk hero uh, that the the less aristocratic classes found her heroic, and yes. and the and the the newspapers of the day understanding who was buying uh, the newspapers and mass certainly were were uh, happy to keep printing stories about Weldon because they would sell papers to mm-hmm. uh, the uh, the not wealthy classes and. and- by the same token, I think in, in a, you know, sort of the unintended consequence of this, not necessarily what she intended uh, through her efforts, um, is that it started to take a, a bit of the stigma away mm-hmm. for having unpopular or eccentric um, ideas, uh, beliefs, um, at least to the extent of it wasn't going to get you sent to the funny farm. Right. <clears throat> and that is, a, is an aspect that I, I think we today really struggle with in, in really wrapping our heads around the, the idea that, that simply having eccentric or esoteric opinions could have dire consequences in a more restrictive social construct. Yes, I mean, you know, it, it, isn't it amusing where today people seem to um, become very distraught over, you know, these kind of issues being flaunted on social media and someone saying boo to them on social media. Um, and, and, and acts as if it's the end of the world, but yet, you know, a little over a hundred years ago, it literally could have been, you were going to be in a psychiatric hospital for the rest of your life. Yes, and it, and it would be the end of your world in that yeah. essence. And <clears throat> the, the, the simple, albeit very chilling fact that um, a, a conven- that this was not uncommon, uh, an, a, a way to, in a in in an era when divorce was very difficult, if not frowned upon, uh, not simply frowned upon, um, that the way that a husband could get rid of a wife that they didn't want anymore was to manage to get them committed as crazy. Exactly. But it's also sort of that interesting spin of the, the quote, science establishment um, mm-hmm. turning on the spiritualists once again, whereas in the beginning, they were the champions of spiritualism. I agree. And in something that we see, again, we see the, the situation where the, uh, the, the social strata of those with uh, the most education mm-hmm. arriving at really interesting and oftentimes uh, deeply restrictive, uh, deeply authoritarian uh, positions, and then upholding those positions with intense zeal, you could even argue religious levels of zeal, and uh, you could in some cases argue uh, frightening levels of neuroticism. Mm-hmm. And at the time, they would have been arguing that they were doing this not only for science, uh, but for the good of humanity. They were, they were, they were helping maintain the proper structure. Very true, and and, and sadly, um, one reason that Mrs. Walden was able to do what she did, aside from her own innate skills um, was that um, she 
did have the funds to pursue her tormentors and uh, in in litigation. Whereas if she had been, you know, a poor girl in, you know, Whitechapel or someplace in London, she mm -hmm. wouldn't have been able to fight it. Um, uh, but as a consequence, you know, her actions ended up helping people in those situations as well. Um, right. So in, in part, they finally picked on a woman who was creative, resourceful, smart enough, and with enough funds to give it back to them. Yes. In many cases, the most uh, deliciously ironic ways that you could imagine. Yes. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. Um, and Georgina Freyhern <laughs> Weldon is, uh, I think, Dark Ozark's newest hero. Yes. Uh, very <laughs> delightful. Um, you know, another issue that, that came up was, um, and it, it's interesting because it still comes up in, in the paranormal field. Uh, the question often comes up. But during this time period, the idea of how, because as spiritualism and particularly the seances and the mediums got more flamboyant um, and lent themselves to accusations of fraud, you know, the, there would be times that supposedly, you know, apparitions would appear and that kind of thing. And so in those seances, as well as in literature of the time, uh, there was a very, there was much a fixation on the wardrobe of the ghost. Yes. <laughs> that still informs us today. Um, because how often do you hear the statement of why, you know, why is a ghost always in, in, in a, you know, a Victorian dress or this or that, you know? <laughs> and, um, and actually during that time period, they, they were expected to, you know, to, to look a certain way. Yes. And, and clothes became, actually clothes became a symbol of the ghost itself. It is, uh, the, 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 the particular reference material on spectral matter, the afterlife of clothes in the 19th century ghost story by Aviva Breffel is a, a fascinating, albeit tedious and pedantic read. Uh, yeah, that, that was, is. <laughs> that was my first takeaway from uh, research this afternoon. <laughs> uh, and yet, as I was going over it, thinking about how much this concept not only informs the paranormal field, but just informs our aspects and ideas of ghosts, of supernatural occurrences, of the afterlife, of the dead. It is absolutely fascinating because, first of all, the the uh, the, the the phenomena uh, for for everyone who has genuinely experienced seeing spirits or spectral manifestations, um, they don't usually show up naked. That's true. Um, I you know I. I encountered a handful of apparitions over time and thankfully they were all dressed. <laughs> it, <laughs> it, <laughs> it comes, that might be the one time I might actually scream. <laughs> it, it, uh, probably for worse rather than better, it gives me a new life goal. Um, <laughs> I, I know where this is going, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm now officially threatening to come back as a naked ghost. So because of course I am. Um of course. yes. Uh I, I ironically I think that of, of all places for pop popular culture to answer. This question, one of the reasons that I, I interestingly enough found Breffel's article so pedantic is <laughs> that the, the answer in the most simplistic form was already given to us in the matrix. 
the 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 physical manifestation of the person within the matrix is however they see themselves yes yes our you know our, our basically our you know our, our sense of self um which is often used to explain why you know well why why did you know why did this ghost show up looking like you know he did when he was 30 but he died when he was 80. that's mm -hmm. how he saw himself yes and and, and that that mm, sort of again we're using the term a lot but the the metaphysical manifestation of our being tends to be associated with how we perceive ourselves within this plane that's true. Now, now I'm frightened to investigate a haunted nudist colony. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away from the beach. Um, <laughs> so and, and, don't go to the Riviera. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just put it away, ghosts. Just put it away. That's um, right. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it also, uh, because the, some of the questions that are brought up in the um, articles that are mentioned within this article, mm -hmm. you know, are, are these tongue in cheek, like where, where do the ghosts get their clothes? Apparently they have ghost clothing factories um, making their clothes for them, that sort of thing. That's very, you know, a, 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 mm, etheric, um, uh, you know, textile factory full of ghosts making things and, uh, you know, perhaps a ghost mercantile. So the ghosts go down to the ghost store and uh, buy their ghost boots. I don't think I ever why, thought why, of why do I see it? Why do I see a movie version of this? That... <laughs> I, I never With thought I would. <laughs> of a tile character's name you say three times. Yeah, I never thought that I was going to use the term ghost boots. Um, and yet here we are. But <laughs> it, it also, you know, thinking about how this, these earlier conjectures um, informed popular culture, you think about, you know, I grew up with, um, with the, the Whitman comic books of Casper the Friendly Ghost. Mm -hmm. And, you know, pre- uh, films with backstories. I, I liked Momentary Rant. I liked short, simple, simply existent stories. We didn't need, we don't need a backstory. I'm just speaking for myself, I don't need a backstory for Casper the Friendly Ghost. I don't need a backstory for The Grinch. I don't need a two hour feature film to explain a 22 minute cartoon. Um, <clears throat> okay, my rant is done. And Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer makes no sense whatsoever, but it is a delightful song. Okay, uh, with that. Here's the answer is that they're, they're really just fan fiction. Yes, yes they are. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> okay. That helps. <laughs> Unless it involves Boris Karloff, it is not canon. I staked my claims on that. So, okay. uh, but w within that, the, the it, it really reminded me, these questions really reminded me of, uh, of the Casper comic books from the... Mm -hmm. the like 1950s on because Casper, the friendly ghost, and the ghostly trio were just sort of living their lives, going about doing their daily tasks. There was no real question of the afterlife. They were just doing their thing. And uh, mm -hmm. Wait, does and that so, sound familiar? Doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it does. And, and then the aspect of going about their lives doing their thing there was you know normal daily comes and goings and stuff um that that would be hinted at or implied or inferred within the 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 process of the story and so you know they need a house and 
they have if you look at the house it has like a dining room table and a kitchen and so on and so forth so it really made me think about that as well as some other uh particularly like for me childhood um comics coloring books storybooks uh you know what do ghosts do in their time off they go to the ghost beach that sort of thing and it really is to me very much informed by these earlier conjectures of what do ghosts wear how do ghosts act those types of things that's true and and uh, i had never really thought about that um before but um there is a reason that you had the progression now and i and and we're still even if it's unconscious affected by that because how often we get people who assume because they just hear oh ghosts are always you know dressed like you know they're from 100 years ago or 200 years ago um um ironically we we don't go into ghosts are in sheets anymore which that was the motif for a long time uh mm -hmm. so we've gone beyond that but applying it to current uh, paranormal issues people will still say you know oh that you never see a you know a ghost that you know looks like they're from 2000 or whatever but that's not the case either um no. you, know, I've, you know i've had a number of uh, investigations that involved sightings of apparitions that you know appeared to be from fairly recent times um one of the more notable ones of it was a you know young man in, in a 1980s uh, jogging suit um, walked up the sidewalk to the house that, that we were investigating, and um, three of us were standing on the porch, and he literally car had walked up or pulled up down the block. Driver got out and walked across the street to a house, and the this person seemed to get out of the driver's side door or the passenger side no one we weren't paying attention to him really so and then walks up to the sidewalk and stands in front of the house and literally says in a, and i and i we're just going wow you know he looks like he's from 1985 with the wind suit and asks you know does mr so-and-so still live here and he was referring to the father of the owner of the house. And one of the other investigators says, no, I'm sorry, he's passed away. His daughter owns the house. And, and the young man stands there and says, he was always really nice. And he just turns on the sidewalk and walks uh, down in front of the second house down. And then suddenly just kind of disappears. And we just kind of look at each other, go inside and talk to the owner. And she figures out and goes and gets her yearbook. And it's a kid who died in a car wreck while they were in high school. And he lived in the house two doors down and he had always mowed their grass. And she said, yeah, he dressed like that all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which goes back to, as you say, how, how he saw himself. And just as with that, experience to me and i found the article interesting mm -hmm. because it bring up all of these but it's asking all the wrong questions yeah it because it's it's attempting to explain phenomena within a metaphysical realm using very mundane or non-esoteric realities to do so. True. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't understand. I, I, I do understand why some maybe some, you know, particularly while the whirl of spiritualism was going on, that perhaps some of these questions did come up to people. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps on a weird friday night or something but yeah. you know but, but yeah i think it was a, a little more um obsessed over in the article than need be 
and you know and i don't i don't blame them they have their their reasons for doing so i i just i think it's interesting because something that once you begin to experience this type of phenomena you have to understand that this kind of phenomena is touching into a plane uh a plane of existence that doesn't function by the rules of physics that we're asking it to exactly uh, that doesn't mean that it doesn't function by its own physics that's true we just don't necessarily understand what that those rules are but then on the other hand we haven't figured out all the physics in the, in the physical world either so right so i think it's mm, is is you know it reminds me a little bit there was a uh, uh a consortium of industrialists and scientists that uh the petition petitioned uh, the U.S. Patent Office to close mm -hmm. around 1839 under the argument that considering the explosion of technology in the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, that everything that could have been invented had already been invented, and there was really no use in keeping the Patent Office open any longer. Yes, and that was before you know, planes and computers and everything else, so. And, and, and presumably this consortium was made up of individuals who were well-educated. Yes, yes, that's, I don't recall, I, I've read about that in the past, I don't recall who all was involved, but uh, they, they were not uh, idle thinkers, no. <laughs> Which, there was a, an interesting quote in the, the um, Harry Houdini article, because it really, it spoke of the fact that uh, uh, Houdini essentially, and I'll paraphrase, but he essentially said that um, individuals who were highly educated, but only along certain lines could be very easily duped. And, and I, I think that that can definitely happen. And sometimes because of their own egos, uh, presuming that they have a good bead on everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Although, you know, I, I do have to say, isn't it ironic that Houdini spent all his time fighting and, you know, seeking to um, expose frauds in the spiritualist movement? He dies and his wife starts conducting seances to, to reach him. Although, Although they did have an agreement that, you know, if he died, that he would try to, to, to reach her. Um, and then ironically that it still goes on, trying, you know. And the fact that he died on Halloween. Yes, yes. Um, you know, some, something in the ether going, ah, let, let, let's play a little joke here. I, I think so. I, you know, again, I it's with many of these situations, I can't help but come back to the, the the nagging thought that our quote unquote primitive or in societies of antiquity had a much stronger ability to help individuals grow into not only maturity but into a metaphysical maturity. Uh, far beyond what the Industrial Revolution or our modern, and I quote unquote modern, i.e. the last 200, 250 years, uh, educational system is managing to accomplish in the modern era. I, I, I agree. And, and, and that goes back eons, you know, before, you know, even before organized religion in the West, etc. It's traditions that you know, are just are just eons old that um, modernity has sort of um, disrupted or at least thrown up some roadblocks that, but you do have to wonder if over time that uh, somehow, you know, those skills will creep back in. I mean, they serve so well for so long that. Um, I, I think it's possible and, and I find that very hopeful. I do too. 
uh, briefly, I do want to just touch on a little bit of these issues as they pertain to current paranormal culture. Um, one would be um, EVP sessions and uh, seances. I, I've heard people say, oh, an EVP session is a seance. It's, you know, uh, and, you know, opening, you know, you know, EVP session opens portals, things like that. Um, and I, I do not adhere to that. Um, you know, EVP session is, is really passive. Um, That's what happens, yeah, what happens happens is you're not being a conduit. Um, and I think I that's one thing. echo that just in the yeah. sense that it's it's objective observation within the space. Exactly. Um, and you know, um, by virtue of the fact too that you certainly can have EVPs even if you are not thinking that you're having EVP uh, EVP sessions. So uh, you could be sitting having breakfast and 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 there be EVPs. You just may not be aware of them unless you record them. Um, and I think you know. That again goes to sort of that that uh, smear campaign against the spiritualists that quote talking with the dead equals something evil, something unnatural, etc. Um, whereas you know, in real time with that, the 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 things that they use to um, slander the spiritualists in seances were more the invisible causation issues, you know, automatic writing, what's causing these things to happen, where the medium acted as a conduit, not an observer, uh, mm -hmm. where the medium is the active participant. Um, and that generally does not happen with right. paranormal investigations. Mm -hmm. It's not limited to a number. I mean, we've been asked a number of times if we have a medium. That mm -hmm. we group it, so. Well, and you and I think you can have a medium, but that that doesn't necessarily mean that you're conducting a seance either. You know, um, the, the the medium is not necessarily a conduit um, where you know a spirit is speaking through them or writing through them, etc. And mm -hmm. I think that is. Uh, one of the differentiations, and I think that's also, again, those behaviors were something that really um, was unsettling to the structure of society at that time, because uh, suddenly people who shouldn't have power, young women that didn't have money, um, had a sense of power that their, their um, more educated, richer peers did not and yeah. um but and and, I th and that was irrespective of whether or not you know quote it was some you know dealing with something evil um so you know i think definitely for people paranormal investigations using evp work does not equal a seance uh typically uh, Another thing, of course, that comes up a lot is, of course, Ouija boards. And ironically, we, the Ouija board uh, came out of this time period uh, shortly after the Civil War, um, um, which um, was a little different than, you know, the, um, the table work, uh, but very close. Um, and ironically, since you mentioned the patent office, um, <laughs> the inventor uh, got a patent on it and was able to secure the patent because convinced the um, patent officials of um, repeated um, corroborative uh, experiments with the Ouija board. He, you know, uh, it kind of goes back to, to home and patient's worth um they couldn't debunk him right. and so they issued a patent and you know i think even the 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 name uh, of the ouija board <clears throat> is is actually a portmanteau 
meaning mm -hmm. yes and yes in French and German. Yes, that's and, correct. And it, and it <clears throat> to me, really speaks uh, heavily to that continental European era. And it is, you know, again, the Second Empire French mm -hmm. uh, uh, space in, in terms of this particular sort of mm, milieu of culture um creating something that that ultimately has become known worldwide exactly and you know and, and one thing that we should say too that through all of this in, in north america and europe was that you know you, you had you had your skeptics that nothing was happening you had those that in the spiritualist movement felt yes this is real um, you had those, particularly in the religious sector, that said, yes, this is real, but it's bad. And then mm -hmm. you had the largest sector that said, oh, this is, this is just fun entertainment. And right. that was really the public perception of most of this. It was. Well, well beyond, even well beyond the spiritualist movement itself. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it really is interesting that in our postmodern society that we now perceive this, particularly the Ouija board, so many people do as something evil, et cetera, that that connotation did not really exist for well over a hundred years. Which is a, it's, it's an interesting progression process. We, we typically see, I mean, we're, we're told that the, the human progression is that it begins with uh, superstition and fear of dark forces, uh, you know, man in the, uh, you know, in the, in the European caves, uh, painting shamanistic images and afraid of the eclipse. Right. Which it, it is fair to argue that the, uh, the, the individuals painting uh, the, the uh, deer men on the Lasco cave um, were, were probably skilled enough astronomers to predict the eclipse, but that's neither here nor there. Um, just conjecture. And that, uh, again, the idea that, that as human nature evolves with the help of the transfiguring help of technology, uh, thank you, General Electric and Edison, that, and uh, Museum of Natural History in Chicago, that we have the diorama, that we, we, we move into a uh, Gene Roddenberry inspired point of pure science and rationality, uh, a, a point of utopia, um, honestly very boring on the galaxy class starship, but you know, still a gorgeous ship and it's still my favorite because I grew up with it, 1987, but anyway, I digress, is that we're just constantly moving out of superstition, that the, mm -hmm. the, the that uh, human evolution of the mind only goes one way, and we're we're moving from primitivism and superstition to rationale and science, and uh, not necessarily. No, no, but I, I do find it interesting in the in the in the current paranormal field that the the methods that are employed to to try to be objective, to, to try to use um, some sort of rigorous observation and um, empirical basis uh, actually mirrors early spiritualism more than anything. And yeah. that ultimately the spiritualist movement diverged from the supernatural and paranormal into um, the ideas of you know, what causes us to think different things and what causes us to uh, be this way or that way and to give notions that of uh, basically equality of the sexes and the temperance movement and things like that. 
workers' rights. Um, uh, so it, it's kind of interesting that spiritualism went off on a, on a tangent and the roots of it sort of were reborn in the late 20th century paranormal movement. I think it's fascinating. And the, the biggest takeaway for me is that the impact of spiritualism is everywhere. It really is. And certainly goes beyond the tropes of late night TV movies, you know. <laughs> and even, uh, you know, my, uh, my favorite talking head inside a crystal ball, uh, Madame Leota inside the Haunted Mansion. Very true, very true. And, uh, but certainly some food for thought and perhaps a, a, a good point to end on tonight. Um, and we want to remind everyone not to forget to check out upcoming events and merchandise at darkosarts.com and paranormalsciencelab.com. Thank you again to Always Buying Boots and Beard Engine Brewing Company for helping to bring the Dark Ozarts to everyone. On the next episode, we are going to be discussing African-American folklore and the paranormal. Catch the Dark Ozarts podcast on Branson Podcast Network, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Substack, or about any other podcast platform. Thank you, everyone. And remember, there are no easy answers in the Dark Ozarks.